Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about measuring and simulating quartz crystals. So what I want to do is first of all look at some available simulation models and well the scarcity of them and then look at how a quartz crystal needs to be measured so that the simulation parameters can be extracted from it so that you can create your own simulation model. So if you're curious about that and much more then keep watching. So let's start off with a few words about what the quartz crystal really is. Well the crystal itself is silicon dioxide and this is a naturally occurring mineral that has the special property of being piezoelectric. And what that means is that if a voltage potential is applied over it, it will change its shape. So you can turn an electric signal into a mechanical vibration and vice versa. And just like any solid object, based on its physical size, it has a mechanical self-resonance frequency. So the quartz crystal electronic component is a piece of crystal cut and polished to a very specific size with a couple electrodes added on top of it. And at a very specific frequency, this structure can be made to resonate. So to either have a very small or very large impedance. And the special thing is that the obtained resonance frequency is very stable, especially compared to other easy to make resonators. So for example, RC or LC oscillators. Therefore, the quartz crystal is a very useful and widely used clock source. Now, the textbook equivalent circuit of a quartz crystal is a series RLC circuit with an extra capacitor added in parallel. And it's important to understand that some of these components don't actually exist inside of the quartz crystal. They're there only to represent a behavior. So it shouldn't be a surprise if we end up working with millihenry level inductors and femtofarad capacitors. So now if we look at how the impedance of this structure would look, first of all, the main capacitor, so C1, which is usually much, much larger than C0, will give us a constantly falling impedance based on the capacity value, but then the series RLC circuit will have a resonance point at which the impedance will drop to a very small level equal to the value of the resistor at a frequency determined by the value of the two reactive components. So we will end up with a dip like this, and then we also have a parallel LC circuit. So our parallel capacitor together with this circuit is forming a parallel LC circuit, which also has a resonance frequency where the impedance reaches a very high level. Now the capacitor in the parallel LC circuit is formed by the two capacitors in series. And when you get two capacitors in series, the equivalent capacitance is smaller than any of the two values. And what that means is that the resonance frequency of the parallel circuit will always be higher than that of the series circuit. So our final impedance curve will look something like this. We will have a constantly falling impedance, a dip, a peak, and then it will continue on. Now it's also important to add that from a terminology point of view, the parallel capacitor is usually called a shunt capacitor and the series components are called motional. So we have a motional capacitor, motional inductor, and motional resistor. But the resistor is also referred to as an equivalent series resistor, or just a simple series resistor. Now, to simulate this component using LTSpice, you can either make your own model from discrete components, or rely on the XTAL model, so you can find this under MESC as XTAL, which is built around the basic capacitor component. So, the default model for a capacitor in LTSpice already contains the series RLC circuit and the extra parallel capacitor. So, you can ignore the two other resistors and simply have your capacitor model as a quartz model. So now, where do we get our parameters from? Well, in some very rare data sheets, like this one from Abracon, we have a few crystals characterized, so they went to the trouble of measuring multiple crystals, extracting the various parameters, and afterwards providing the equivalent model and, well, the parameters for it. So you can take the parameters from this model and use them in your simulation. So if we try to simulate one of these components and extract its impedance, let's just go to logarithmic plot, 
we see our characteristic impedance curve. So we have our impedance having a dip and then a peak and then continuing onwards. And if we look at the impedance over a much wider frequency range, so here I'm going from 10 MHz up to 100 MHz, we see our constantly falling slope caused by the parallel capacitor. But what do you do if you don't have these parameters in the datasheet? So normally your quartz datasheet will look something like this. You'll have some frequency ranges, specified some tolerances, and the only parameter out of our four components will be the ESR. So this will be stated as a maximum value, and well, nothing else will be provided. So what do you do then? Well, in most cases, the only way to make a simulation model is to measure the crystal component. What that means is to measure its impedance under various conditions. And to check how that can be done, I prepared the setup to measure an unknown crystal. So what I have here is a random 4 MHz crystal that I found in my component box. I have no datasheet or other specifications about it, except that it's supposed to run at 4 MHz. And today I will try to fully characterize it. Now, regardless of what crystal you have running at what frequency, the exact same steps can be used to achieve this goal. So to perform the measurement, the basic tool that you need is a network analyzer. And you can use a fancy one, or you can use a basic one like the analog discovery tool. And I will be setting it into impedance mode. And to connect the coarse crystal to the analog discovery, I built a small adapter board that connects the coarse crystal to a known value resistor and to the oscilloscope channels and the first waveform generator. So the exact setup is the one described in the setting of the impedance measurement. Now, as with any network analyzer, the first thing to do before you start your measurement is to run a calibration run, so a compensation in which you compensate for an open circuit and for a short circuit, so that the device knows exactly what sort of load the test fixture is providing which can then be subtracted from the actual measurement. So after doing this measurement, I have my quartz crystal connected, so we can finally run our impedance measurement. Now I'm measuring between 3.97 MHz and 4.03, so very close to our 4 MHz, and we can see that the wave shape is as expected. So first of all we have a dip in impedance and then we have a peak, we can also observe that before and after the two resonance frequencies we have a minus 90 degrees phase shift. In between them we have a plus 90 degrees phase shift, so we have an inductive behavior. And we can also see our impedance slowly dropping before and after these two resonance points, so the parallel capacitor's effect is visible here. This might be a bit more obvious if we look at the much wider span though. So right now I'm performing a measurement between 3 and 5 megahertz. We see our resonance frequency at 4 MHz, we see some other things appearing, but in general we can see that our impedance is constantly dropping. So this is the effect of the parallel capacitor. And we can extract its value by seeing exactly what sort of impedance we get at the frequency at which we have a purely capacitive behavior. So if we look at, for example, 3.0 something MHz, we can see the impedance, and from this we can calculate what the equivalent parallel capacitor is. Now another thing that we can get from this measurement is the ESR, so our series resistance. But to get this measurement done accurately, we need a very detailed measurement around our resonance points. So on this measurement running from 3.97 MHz up to 4.03, we can check the minimal impedance value, so this is about 68 ohms. So this is the frequency at which the capacitive and the inductive series elements cancel out, so we only see the ESR. Now if we look at this graph in a bit more detail, we will also notice that none of the two resonance frequencies is at 4 MHz. So the first resonance is at 3.9997, the other is at 4.003. And now normally this is not a measurement error. It's perfectly normal to see this sort of graph. To understand why that is, if we look into a more detailed quartz crystal datasheet, we will see that the various crystals are specified for various load capacitances. So on the one side we have a series term added in here, which basically means that the quartz is designed to work in series resonance mode. So for example, a 4 MHz quartz crystal designed for series mode 
will have the first resonance, the series resonance, at exactly 4 MHz, whereas quartz crystals designed for parallel resonance mode will need an extra load capacitance to get to the desired frequency. So in our case, we most likely have a parallel quartz crystal. That's why we see our second resonance not at 4 MHz, but we can get this to 4 MHz if we add a certain load capacitance. So this second resonance point is dependent on the equivalent parallel capacitance added externally to the quartz crystal. Now, to see how that works, I will be adding an extra parallel capacitor, but before doing that, we need to check exactly at what frequency our initial resonance frequency is, because from this frequency and the frequency that we get when we add the extra load capacitance, can calculate our series and parallel internal inductors. So we can see that we have 4.0036 MHz when no extra external capacitor is added. But now if I add a 10 picofarad capacitor, and before rerunning the simulation, let me just add the two cursors so that we can see where our resonance frequencies were to begin with. We can already see our first resonance frequency was unaffected, so our series resonance is independent of any parallel capacity that's being added to the quartz crystal, but our second resonance frequency substantially moved. So from our initial 4.0036 MHz, by adding the extra 10 picofarads, we are down to 4.0003 MHz. So we're much closer to the 4 MHz that the crystal is designed to work at. Point being that, from this we can see that we need more than 10 picofarads to get it to that value. But anyway, now let's see how we can calculate our parameters. So without going into too many details, I put the formulas up here. So first of all, we can calculate the motional capacitance based on our two resonance frequencies, once with the capacitor added and once without the capacitor added, and also taking into account the initial shunt capacitance that we calculated previously. And using this value, together with our series resonance frequency, we can also calculate our motional inductance. But now, how do we know if the calculations are any good? I mean, you can do anything you want on paper. Well, to verify these numbers, let's turn to a simulation. And for that, what I did here was add the values that we just calculated into these two models. Now, the only difference between the two circuits is that the motional inductance has this extra 0.6 millihenry in its value. So we'll just see in a moment if that makes any sort of difference. So if we run the simulation, look at our first circuit, we see that we have the right shape. So first of all, we have our impedance dip, then our impedance peak. It's roughly around 4 megahertz. It's not really in the right place. So if we compare this to our actual measurement, our two resonance points are shifted to the right. But now, if we look at the other circuit, we see that our resonance points are closer to where they should be. So when creating simulation models for quartz crystals, if you just want to simulate the behavior, you can use parameters with two or three digits and that will be enough. But if you want to very accurately simulate the exact resonance points at which the quartz resonates, you're going to need very detailed component parameters. So even so, we still have some issues. So my components have some of the values rounded a bit. So that's why it's not exactly in the same place where our measurement was. Now, if we come back to our measurement, right now I reinserted the quartz crystal by itself without any capacitor, but I'm running a measurement from one megahertz up to 25. So way beyond our initial resonance frequency that we were interested in. Now, because of the multiple measurement points, so I'm running with 5,000 measurement points, th the measurement is gonna take a while. And now that the measurement is done, what we can see is that other than our main resonance frequency at four megahertz, we have some other, well, smaller resonances, but these are not of that much importance. But what we can see, which is important, is our overtones. So at odd multiples of our fundamental frequency, so three times the initial frequency, five times and well, seven times is a bit later, we see our secondary resonances of our quartz crystal. Now, depending on how the crystal is designed to be used, either for the fundamental frequency or for these overtones, 
the oscillator that you end up building will have to work on the desired frequency. And well, it makes sense to try to simulate also these overtones in your model because you want to make sure that your oscillator oscillates at the particular frequency that you want. So it doesn't accidentally end up oscillating at one of these overtones. Or on the other hand, if it has to oscillate on the overtones, you want to make sure that it does not oscillate on the fundamental. Now for all of these extra resonances, parameter extraction can be done exactly the same way as for the fundamental frequency. So by adding and removing an extra load capacitance, and for my particular quartz crystal, I extracted these extra parameters for the third overtone. Now it's important to also mention that the analog discovery only supports a maximum of 10 MHz in the signal generator, but you can run the impedance measurement up to 25, but you start running into bandwidth limitations. So the measurements won't be exact above 10 MHz. But regardless, these are the values that I got for the third overtone. Now for each of these resonance points, you can build this sort of RLC circuits and put them all in parallel. So if we run this simulation, we can see our fundamental frequency was unaffected, it's still at 4 MHz. We see our second overtone is slightly above 12 MHz, so again, this is a problem of the component values being rounded to some larger values than they should be. And well, in the same way you could add extra RLC circuits to simulate further overtones. So in the end, if you don't have a simulation model for your particular quartz crystal, and you happen to have a network analyzer that has an impedance measurement function, well then you can create your own simulation models. Now of course there's far more to simulating quartz crystals than just the resonance frequencies, but that's a topic for a different time. But for now, Hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.